All right. So this is a presentation that I've wanted to do for uh, about a year now. Um, I'm glad I'm finally getting around to doing it. Um, so yeah, let's let's just get into it. I wanted to start by mentioning some of Joe Rogan's sponsors. This is going to be the theme of this presentation is the corporate and cultural agendas that Joe Rogan is involved in. Now this is the type of information that's not fun to research yourself. Um, it's just better if someone presents it. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, if you haven't yet, check out the work of Jan Irvin. He has, he's a vet. He's been doing this forever. He was involved with Joe Rogan early on. He's actually the guy who gave him DMT originally. Um, and, and he was offered positions. So he understands how this works. And he's covered it very well. Um, also, Jesse Spots. I, I would like to recommend his playlist for the Intellectual Dark Web. He does some great research please check that out. I'm going to touch on the intellectual dark web a little bit. This is the rising centrist movement we see in this country, right? Trump is a monkey wrench, a chaos agent for a new brave new world, a centrist movement, a unifying movement. All right. So, so let's start with Rogan sponsors. So cash app is a big one. Jones mentioned that. Okay. Jack, the Jack Dorsey connection. And then Everybody that followed, so this has been covered at nauseum, so I'm not going to really focus on Cash App and Dorsey, but there are some that people looked over, so like 23andMe, this is a big one, directly sponsoring Rogan's podcast. So 23andMe is co-founded and owned by Ann Wojarski, the Jewess, okay? Ann is the sister of Susan Wojarski, the Jewess, who is the CEO of YouTube, I'm sure you're all familiar, and she familiar with her and she was form and was formerly married to Sergey Brin the co-founder of Google okay so you should be aware of the 23andMe database um, system the whole agenda with that uh, Rogan used to try to be slick with it and he would just be like oh yeah you should do the the 23andMe because they tell you all your health risks and you know he would promote it that's how his podcast works every other sentence in his podcast is a corporate plug or a cultural plug a cultural agenda or a corporate agenda for example he'll he'll uh you know he'll mention some pasta that he gets from italy and, and acts like he just likes the product no he's getting paid to do that that's how his podcast works okay people need to understand that and and his influence is beyond anything we've ever seen his podcast is so influential because of its base in Los Angeles, and then also it spreads everywhere else. So you can set the trends in Los Angeles, and they spread everywhere else. And that's exactly what we see going on with Rogan. He is by far the most uh, crucial asset for the information age at this point in time. Okay, and then another person who sits on the board and is high level in 23andMe is Esther Dyson. Now I want to highlight her because of her involvement in commercial and privatized space, which is a common theme we see running through these Rogan Jones type networks. Okay. So, so as of early 2007, Dyson describes herself as spending more and more time on the private aviation and commercial space startups. Also in healthcare and genetics, Dyson is a founding member of space angels networks and is invested in XCOR, Constellation Services, Zero G, Icon Aircraft, Space Adventures, and Mars One. Now, Mars One is a well known scam. And I want you to think about how long commercial and privatized space has been in the conversation, right? There's a news article for it, you know, at least once a week that somebody's taking the step for commercial space. And for decades we've seen this. Richard Branson, you know, et cetera, et cetera, Elon Musk. What do we see come out of it? Nothing, because it's a scam. Now, it would be easier for you to understand this if you understand the scam that NASA is. Now, if you're completely unaware of that or unfamiliar with that subject, email me, northmattheww at gmail.com, and I will send you proof and evidence that NASA is a scam, scamming $52 million a day from the laughing stock of the world, U.S. taxpayers. Okay, so that's a common theme, again, is commercial and privatized space that we see running through these networks. It's my contention that they're essentially funnels for that money to be funneled into 
other movements and other agendas, i.e. an information uh, information age asset like Joe Rogan. So let's move on to Elon Musk. Now, I believe, although Elon is not listed as although Elon is not listed as a sponsor he is a sponsor and here's why I think that in Colorado but I did like... just get a Tesla oh. so I'm supporting the podcast well, I, well... <laughs> okay did you hear that okay he said I, I just I did just in Colorado but I did like... just get a Tesla so I'm supporting the podcast. Well, I, well, I did just get a Tesla, so I'm supporting the podcast. How does that follow? Buying a Tesla supports Joe Rogan's podcast. Hmm. Is Elon Musk subsidizing Rogan's podcast for an agenda? For propaganda purposes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we saw this demonstrated with the securing funded... When, when Elon smoked the blunt, when he hit the backwood on Rogan's podcast... That was them manipulating stock prices. That was completely fake. And there were plenty of YouTube videos that I posted in my community section, um, articles, but they all got scrubbed because Rogan has that much access and influence. They all got scrubbed. So most, a lot of people don't understand that when Elon Musk tweets funding secure at 420 and then he gets up there and, and puffs on the blunt, that was them manipulating stock prices. Provably, them manipulating stock prices. That's what was going on there. That was fake. Joe Rogan's podcast is the realest fake thing you'll ever see. It's very scripted. It's very corporatized. And there's an agenda behind almost everything he does on that podcast. But it seems organic. But it's not. It's not. He'll also do things like, oh, what's that square state? Uh, how would they? How do they end up with a perfectly square state acting like he doesn't know what Wyoming is? He's been to Wyoming. He understands what Wyoming is. He knows what that state is. But he acts like he doesn't for that interaction with his audience. So his audience could be like, oh, it's Wyoming, Joe, you idiot. He understands that. That interaction that he's getting with his audience is getting them engaged. It's that sophisticated. It's that controlled. He's looking for that engagement. Okay? Um, and that's kind of a point that, that Jones made uh, when he was on the podcast last time, uh, which is a point I've been making for over a year now. Um, and I have emails to prove that. But also, Joe Rogan with Elon Musk, the, neuro, the Neuralink, which he's been promoting, right? The, the brain lace. This is an agenda that he was promo promoting long before Elon Musk came out with the Neuralink. Now we're seeing this all over now. We're seeing brain chips, all this idea promoted everywhere. Where did it start? Who was the cultural change agent that originally started pushing this out into the uh, the collective unconscious, if you will? Well, Joe did. So this, let's listen to this from a recent podcast, 2019. That yeah. used to hang around. I think the cure That's is mind on. reading. And I think we're going to accept that cure because, uh, you know, Elon is working on some sort of neural link thing. That's the only he, way we'll know if someone's telling the truth. We're going to have yeah. it. I think it's good. We're going to accept it and we're going to give in and we're going to yeah. we're we're going to be able to. I, I'll take it another step further. I think they're going to create a universal language. I've been thinking about yeah. this a lot. I think there's going to be a universal language that probably is uh, augmented reality, some augmented reality language mm -hmm. of shapes or sim yeah, some kind of symbolism. That symbols. Symbols. Yeah, mm -hmm. something that, that we agree verbal. to. And we're, we're probably not going to accept it because we're old. We're like, fuck this. Yeah. Next generation. Our though. kids, maybe even our kids' kids. Our kids' kids are going to be the yeah. first people to adopt it. And then it's going to be universal worldwide. And with augmented reality and some sort of ability to interact with each other yeah. through I kinda, bandwidth. I remember through bandwidth. Okay, so it's going to happen. You notice that it's inevitable. No matter what this is going to happen, you're going to accept it. So let's listen to this from 2014. How was Joe aware of this agenda years ago? 5 plus years ago. How was he aware of this? Why was he promoting this idea? Because he's been working with these circles for a long time. 
I think that one of the things that's coming out with technology is access to information and access to mm. information, not just current information, but maybe even future, like right. the, the ability to read minds, to read thoughts, to read. Okay. So let's finish this up from the same podcast, finishing on that thought. Technological symbiotic relationship takes place mm. to the point where mm -hmm. we essentially our, our our memories especially right they're pretty piss poor right but if we can turn our memories into some digital archive that you can access at will then we're going to know i'm going to i'm going to look in your head and i'm going to know what's going on right. i'm going to be able to tap into it we will we'll, we'll be connected the same way we're connected with wi-fi the same way our cell phones are connected through the cellular network there'll be some sort of a network of information exchange mm. between all people and if that's the case deception will be almost impossible. Right. Motivations will right. be crystal clear. And you're going to know who's full of shit. It's going to be a fucking bad day for a lot of it. Okay. So, again, promoting that agenda for a long time now. Um, let's move on here. Again, saying it's inevitable. That was Elon's other thing that he said on the podcast. You're already a cyborg. You have a phone. It just, it's not in your body, but it's yeah. something you're holding on to. Yeah. yeah, it's, kind of read it's third, voluntary cyborg. Did you guys read Third Wave years ago? Was that a book you ever got no. into? No, no. That was the prediction of all this. Really? Yeah, and it, yeah. it's in the uh, early 80s. And it was a prediction, and the one thing uh, Third Wave predicted was that... Okay, so we have Third Wave mentioned there, which Jones also mentioned on his recent podcast. Now, that's very interesting to me, and this is a common theme in my life. That is something that I was researching long ago and that I was going to include in this regardless and, and other other things. Um, let me pull this up here. Th third wave. Information overload. Okay? Future shock. Okay, now... Now, Toffler... Alvin Toffler, the guy who wrote this, is involved with the Revolution and Military Affairs crew, the future Soviet warfare theory pushers within our own countries. Okay, the people that are involved in the New York, Moscow, Tel Aviv triangle. Those who have infiltrated the highest institutions in our country and have subverted them for the East's benefit, for Israel's benefit, and via the back door into the West, Israel, for Russia's benefit, for China's benefit. Okay, so I want you to look at the date here. This is from my notes on my other computer. June 7th, 2018. I have never heard this mentioned by any other uh, researcher, anything. This is something I found my own on Wikipedia and, and included it into my research. Now, all of a sudden, recently, it's being mentioned on Joe Rogan's podcast. I find that very interesting. So, Tofler coined the term future shock to refer to what happens to a society when it changes when a change happens too fast which results in social confusion and normal decision-making process breaks down. He continued the theme in Third Wave, 1980, when he describes the first and second wave of as agricultural industrial revolutions. The third wave, a phrase he coined, represents the current information computer-based revolution. Now remember, this was in 1980. He forecast the spread of, of the internet and email, interactive media, cable television, cloning, and other digital advancements. He claimed that one side of the effect, uh, once he claimed that one of the side effects of the digital age has been information overload, another term he has coined. Okay, so information overload or information apocalypse, as Steve Pachenik referred to it in his novels, is what we're living through right now. So information overload, too much information, there has to be a solution, problem, reaction, solution chaos order out of chaos that's exactly what we're seeing and the solution for them is a brave new world that is the agenda here the centrist brave new world agenda um so let's move on to well okay so it's the bigger plan Let, let's do this it's the bigger plan Let's listen to what Jones has to say about the bigger plan. Wow. Today, we're going to have Zach on.
who's just a really smart guy and a great source and really already tells me things that I already basically know from other sources, but he likes to come on the show and we like to have him on the show. And he knows Elon Musk and he knows Louis Farrakhan, a lot of other folks uh, that behind the scenes have been reached out to and, and basically have been uh, resonating with, especially if you talk about somebody like Elon Musk with the bigger plan. Now, what is the bigger plan? That's a good question, Jones. What is the bigger plan? Now, I'll finish up with Zach here once I move on to the next sponsor. Zach is friends with both Rogan and Jones, as well as Elon Musk and others. Um, he's the one who set up the whole Kanye West situation. Um, let, let, let's, let's listen to this clip real quick. Yeah, I'm hoping that having him in office is such a that the whole thing was such a clusterfuck and, and that so many people are so disturbed that it's going to make people more politically active yeah. and more aware of the consequences of having someone like that in office. Yeah, and actually, weirdly, unifying. Yeah. Because... Weirdly unifying. Chaos. Order out of chaos. I have clips of Jones as well saying that Trump was a monkey wrench thrown into the system to create chaos. Because you can create order out of chaos. So, unifying, a centrist unifying movement that instant gives you miracles, gives you new plant-based solutions, gives you, gives you new solutions to big pharma, gives you new solutions in technology. It sounds wonderful, but they're used as methods of control for further enslavement for a brave new world. That's why these, this needs to be highlighted, and the change agents involved in this agenda need to be highlighted and hammered on. Okay, so let's move on to the next sponsor here, <clears throat> which Jones made veiled threats at, right here, on it. Aubrey Marcus and Joe Rogan. Now, when Jones was referencing DMT cults in Austin, he was referencing working with Pentagon and DARPA. He was referencing on it. And who well and who on it's associated with. Now I knew the whole situation with Jones wasn't authentic from the beginning. I knew that threatening on it was a legitimately Jones putting pressure on Rogan and having Jan Irving on was actually him putting pressure on Rogan but I knew he would never go anywhere he was doing it because he was pissed at him he was doing it because of the Soros talking points but as we'll get into here in a second Joe was so deeply involved with Soros that you know it, 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 come on Jones so I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere, is my point. I knew that these are overlapping networks, like a Venn diagram, overlapping, that this would end not end up going anywhere. So let, let's get into on it here. So, the, this is a Reddit post from three years ago. Uh, whoever put this together did a, a good job of highlighting the shell companies that Aubrey's dad was involved in. So we're going to see... Mafia connections here, corporate connections here, and Pentagon connections here. Those are the big three that are operating these networks. So the true history of Onnit, originally founded by Aubrey Marcus's Texas oil man father, Michael Marcus, and originally formulated by Aubrey's stepmother, uh, Janet Zand, an acupuncturist. So let's go ahead and read this. Michael Marcus, father of Aubrey Marcus... Michael Marcus is a commodities trader who in less than 20 years reputed to have turned his initial 30000 into $80 million. Notably missing from that Wikipedia page is how Michael Marcus made his millions in oil and gas. Aubrey Marcus's dad, Michael P. Marcus, named a business Coffee Exchange, Inc., which he later changed to Touchstone Resources. And then he again changed to Cygnus Oil and Gas, which owns working interests in approximately 13 oil and gas projects in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Alabama, and New Zealand. Okay, so are we seeing a common theme here? Are we smelling shell companies? 
Aubrey Marcus's dad, Michael P. Marcus, started another business named All American Burger, which he changed to Bexy Communications, which he again changed to Sherney Energy. What is Sherney Energy? Sherney Energy is a billion dollar oil company. Aubrey Marcus's dad started another business named Expressions Graphic Inc., which he again changed to Continental Southern Resources, which he again changed to Endeavor International Corporation, another oil company which ended up screwing investors out of their money. Scams. Scams. For agendas. So, Aubrey Marcus was a trust fund kid with millions of dollars from his dad, Michael Marcus's oil business to play around with. He's a non-entity, a mouthpiece, and would have been forever known as the guy who invented nail polish for men. Which, by the way, is... he did. And he called it Alpha. That... that was the, the marketing there. <clears throat> um... So, and then the flashlight. That came from Onnit, Joe Rogan's co-founders of Onnit with Aubrey. No, on it's huge with their connections, which we're going to get into here in a minute. Um, the flashlight, there's a whole agenda with that. I'm not going to get into that, but that was what, that's his initial, you know, hawking product on his uh, podcast, just being a complete sellout, just all about the money, right? He he acts like he actually cares about people. He acts like he actually cares about the world. No, he's all about money and his own personal interests. Okay, so let's move on to some interesting things about Aubrey here. So, this is a good article to read. Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, competitor Travis Nueza made bizarre accusations that on its CEO blocked him from EBI competition. Now, why did he block him? BJJ competitor Travis is claiming that the CEO of founder Aubrey Marcus pressured him for a sexual relationship. Travis claims that he, once he declined his, declined his pay for working at Onnit was drastically cut, and that Aubrey blocked him from competing at the Eddie Bravo Invitational. Now Eddie's involved in this agenda as well. Eddie is propped up because he is so bad at cons explaining conspiracy theories. Theor conspiracy theories, quote unquote, is so bad at it that it actually has the opposite effect. Okay, he's involved in all kinds of conspiracies himself. Okay, he's he's embedded in this network as well. Eddie Bravo knew about Elon Musk a long time ago, years ago. He also knew about Jones's relationship with Musk and the whole agenda that's unfolding here. Okay, uh, Aubrey Marcus is a homosexual. I also have clips of. Well, I don't have the clips, but I could go get them. Joe, I'm sure many of you know, recently Joe has been talking about how it is common knowledge that within the martial arts community, men are pressured to sleep with higher-ups to get in positions. He's been saying that recently. Okay, that's absolutely true. Now, you're trying to tell me this man is not a homosexual. He's absolutely a homosexual. These guys are switch hitters. Now, he has a wife who looks like a man. Um, there's probably a reason for that. But that's what's going on here. So let's get into Aubrey's bio a little bit here. Um, oh, I, I, let me let me play these clips first. Because th this is, jo like I said, Jones could have buried on it simply. Jones could have buried Rogan simply with on it. But he chose not to. Why? Because he was always there. He was always involved. He always has known what's going on. So let's watch a couple of these clips here. Oh yeah, look around. Hey, Aubrey. Aubrey needs show. to hire Olivia over there uh, at a high yeah. salary. I'm, or I'm gonna hire her away. <laughs> you wow. can't, I just brought her in for an interview. I, you can't take her in the first hour. No, no, no. <laughs> you gotta no. give me a chance. On the, the bones of, of what? No, 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 bones? no. No, you wanna work her? This is cool. We can just carry on the stories over right here. We're gonna we're gonna be working together. It's almost happened a couple times already. We're gonna be working together now. Jones is obviously coked up in this podcast. Anytime you come around these on it connected maps connected people that are researching drugs for um, corporate and government agendas, they seem to have a steady supply uh, that you can guess where it's coming from. Now. Jones has said he's going to be working with on it. That's interesting. 
Let's watch this one. Want to hear some more? Uh -huh. Here, here, let's do the <laughs> voice from Heavy Metal. My evil extends across all time, all <laughs> galaxies, all dimensions. A green jewel. Look into me one last time. <laughs> Strong. I don't know who that is. But I don't know who that is. Great. Now we're having Darth Vader. That's still Darth Vader. I am here to tell you the secret of the Loch Ness is on it. It is the oh, Alpha yeah. Brain. I've OD'd on Alpha Brain and found Valhalla. No need, <laughs> no need for ayahuasca. <laughs> but the Nemesis Brain Force has arrived. A little little plugging now. Uh -huh. Brain Force. Now Jones actually modeled Brain Force after after Alpha Power. It's the same formulation. It's the same product. Um, actually, and Jones's uh, supplement structure is based off on it as well. He he's doing a lot of the same things, where there's a lot of a lot of shady things going on in, in that aspect of it. So, let's move on to this last clip here. It's so crazy. It's cra man. In fact, yeah. Shane Steiner. Let me, Are let me you mentioned real fast that the. Um, he mentioned the Lochnar. I kept it in there for a reason. Lochnar from uh, Heavy Metal, that 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 movie. It's actually very good, um, and it's an allegory. The Lochnar is Lucifer, the green light, and it, it's interesting to me that he associated on it with Lucifer. Just an interesting statement there. You Bill Hicks. Shane Steiner. Are you Bill Hicks? Where's Shane Steiner? Let's bring now. I didn't want to include th this part in here, but I had to to get this clip. Every time Jones is around, people from on it, co these corporate people, Hollywood people, comedians, they always call him Bill Hicks. Now he's going to call a guy named Shane Steiner in here. Bring him in here. <laughs> I went to freaking high school with this guy. We had Texas Monthly call me about a year ago. How could you say some? How could you Texas Monthly called me about a year ago. Right when Bill Hicks died, and they said, and they said, and see, that's the crazy conspiracy. Now, what Eddie's doing there, how could you say someone's someone and, and people believe it? He's saying that there's a reason that conspiracy has legs. If you understand how he works, he's saying there's a reason, and, and notice how uncomfortable these people get. There's a reason he's saying that. There's a reason the conspiracy has traction. There's a reason people believe it. There's a reason I believe that. Okay? Right, there he doesn't mean you can just make up whatever you want yes. in like the world's fiction. <laughs> does he look like him? And does Shane Stein, I look nothing like him. And they say I'm, they say I'm 60 years old. Did Shane leave? Yeah, yeah. See, he's diverting. He's, he's, hey, let's he's get diverting. Shane. This is a cool guy. This is the guy that got me in here because he told me I did Oh, look. The fight companion Shane, grows. they just asked me if I'm... Now, Shane is the person who got Jones in there. Now, Shane Steiner is a Hollywood guy, a musician, very well connected. Um, and seems to be the only person that Jones went to high school with. And also looks a whole hell of a lot younger than Jones. But I want to highlight that point because Shane got him in there. Shane, according to Alex Jones, and I have the timestamp, I just have to go back to the GCN archives and get it since the, uh, all of his YouTube records were scrubbed. But on 05-25, uh, 2018, at around 1 hour and 21 minutes now... That's going to be different because of the commercial breaks from the live stream. Jones claimed that Shane Steiner comes from the Dixie Mafia. His family is Dixie Mafia. So again, Mafia, Corporate, Pentagon. That's who's dictating these circles. So let's finish up with Aubrey's bio here. Aubrey Marcus is the founder and CEO of Onnit, a lifestyle brand based on holistic health philosophy. He calls total human optimization. Onnit is an uh, Inc. 500 company and an industry leader with products optimizing millions of lives, including many of the top professional athletes around the world. He regularly provides commentary to outlets like uh, The Entrepreneur, Forbes, The Doctors, and the Joe Rogan experience if you ask Aubrey what causes uh, what cause he is most passionate about it is raising awareness for psychedelic medicine key psychedelic medicine or plant-based medicine through organizations like maps and the Hefter Institute he is a 20-year native of Austin where he currently resides maps and the Hef Hefner Institute now before I move into maps and Hefner Hefter, I want to 
play this for you real quick and, and get you asking yourself a question here. Hi, Tim Kennedy. I you, think you know what I think. I about? try to take I think it down. It's the drugs. Oh fuck! Did we do drugs then? Yeah, we did. We did DMT. Was that the? That was, was the that next the, that, day, that was bro. The, that's really? so emotional. Wait, wait, wait. Are you sure? Yeah, I went through it. I'm like, why was I crying like that? That's Dude, interesting. Hey, hold up. Could not stop crying. So Brennan and I did. We did um, DMT. We did a DMT did uh, uh, trip. We didn't know what, what we, you we say, didn't Jim? Know. I said I can't believe. By the way, what, what is he doing with his hand here? Why is this guy always rubbing on himself? You guys did that, dude. We really? didn't even know. DMT. We didn't I would know do it right we now. Didn't, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> we didn't know it's what ayahuasca is. We didn't know what to expect. I'm into psychedelics now. I've never. I haven't done it, but I want to do acid next. Listen, if you're young and listening to this, don't. I'm 52. <laughs> and, no, DMT, I'm acid, I'm, I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't advocate drugs for anybody who's young, out. okay? But if you're an adult, it's up to you. But DMT, DMT was awesome. DMT, so I'm not, I'm not a drug guy, right? I'm, I'm not, I never have a drug yeah. guy. Never, not cocaine, not even weed, right? Not really a boozer. So we, we find out we're going we're gonna to be invited. We're invited to this quote unquote ceremony. By a shaman who will remain nameless, <laughs> and Brent and I, <laughs> Bobby Marcus, yeah, you know what were you saying? And Brent and I look at each other. We're like, are, are we going to do this? I, I'm not going. So I don't want to bore you with the rest of that clip. But they go on to say they smoke DMT. Now this is in America that they're doing this. How are these people getting away with giving people DMT in these cults and these self help DMT cults? How are they getting away with doing this in America illegally? Ask yourself that question. It's illegal, but they can get out a podcast to talk about it and send people in that direction. Um, I, I want to finish up here. Uh, let's let's. Uh, I guess I'll mention on the on the fake beef. Now I started putting this together, and this was always going to be my opinion on it. Like I said, there was two things Jones did: threatening on it and having Yan on that were legitimate. But clips like this always were ringing in my memory. People have said. Such- Elon Musk is a patriot. Assange is a patriot. And I can tell you right now that Musk is a fan of yours. Um, I could tell you the same way. Maybe you didn't know who I was back then, but Farrakhan was a fan of yours. The problem is Elon Musk has picked his side. He's in with DOD. But today we're going to have Zach on, who's just really scenes have somebody like Elon Musk with the bigger plan. Now, what is the bigger plan? I mean, you told me you'll soon see Kanye at the White House. Uh, you know, you shed the. T- By the way, Zach is the one who was behind the whole Kanye West situation, uh, and I was the only one that took him seriously. That's how I was able to predict the Kanye West situation long before anybody else did, because I listened to what this guy had to say. Now, everybody thought he was too young. Everybody thought he wasn't anything. That he was just some kid, you know, on a navy ship somewhere calling in. No, this guy's. Involved. This guy has been involved for Cy War, with Cywar for a long time. Now he currently resides uh, at Space Command, former Cent- CENTCOM. Um, he was involved with the Fort Hood shooting. He worked with Voice of America as uh, a victim Muslim. He also worked with CARE as a double agent. Okay? Culture will speak, and you've, you've not predicted. You know a lot of what's coming. Uh, and, and what's going to be unfolding. First of all, I've had some conversations out there in those hills out there in Calabasas with Joe Rogan. With Joe Rogan. And Zach's a great source of really interesting information. And I know who he is, who his identity is, and some of the things he's done behind the scenes and things that have unfolded. Uh, and so he is who he says he is. He does do what he says he's doing. And, and I can confirm some of the stuff he's been up to out in Las Vegas and out in... Florida and out in uh, uh, L.A. as well. L.A. as well. Okay, so he also knows Elon Musk, Joe Rogan, and Alex Jones. So we're having a military guy go in between these guys, and it's kind of dictating which directions they go in, possibly, or influencing them in some way or another. But that was something that was always in my head. These people can't really dislike each other, or they can dislike each other, but they can't really attack each other because they're involved in the same networks. They're Pentagon assets for the information age, as well as corporate assets. 
Um, and then this is from the fight. Uh, this is something that I don't think anybody picked up on. Very Like 99.9% .9 of the listeners did not pick up on what he was saying here. But I, I did. You're the bitch and you get ready for it. <laughs> That's how this works. Pilgrim. Keep. That's how this works. Pilgrim. What does that mean? Pilgrim. Well, the Pilgrim Society is a British intelligence front. Now, remember, with the intelligence community, it's a giant spider web with Israel at the center of it. But the Pilgrim Society is something that all the early MK Ultra guys were involved in. You know, uh, Halpern, all the all those people coming out of the Pilgrim Society or associated with the Pilgrim Society, Alan Watts, all the mk ultra people all those cultural 60s change agents were coming out of there now this is something where i think i would see an overlap with these two uh because jones is surrounded by british intelligence you know uh, example ted malik uh, total mi6 um but again uh, you would see this is like a venn diagram and you have these overlapping networks that they're both involved in um and then let's let's finish it off this is also from the beef that was going on so just stop acting like you don't we have a state of the union coming up let's finish up this clip or fill in the blank whatever ridiculous conspiracy the rothschilds the fucking rockefellers whatever it is i'm not talking about that because the government threatened my family That's Sorry, let's so just stop acting like you don't we have a state of the union coming up let's finish up this clip or fill in the blank whatever ridiculous conspiracy the Rothschilds, the fucking Rockefellers, whatever it is. I'm not talking about that because the government threatened my family. That is fucking wrong. It's ridiculous. And now you put it out there. So hey, pause Alex, again. Hey, hey, I, I have a question for Mr. Rogan here. Hmm. Um, is it ridiculous because um, the Rockefellers fund maps, which fund you? Is it ridiculous for that reason? I mean, are the Rockefellers not real? Do they not have a track record of funding destructive, uh, subversive movements within this country for their own benefit? Is that why it's ridiculous, Joe? So we'll get into maps here in a second and explain to you exactly what it is, but this is when Joe... When these maps people came around, Dennis McKenna, etc., when they came around, Joe stopped front-loading his podcast with ads. This is when he became ad-free. So let's watch this real quick. And just press the music. Let's just go right with music. Right. <laughs> By the way, Jamie's struggling. I'm going to get into Jamie later, but Jamie seems to always struggle for, especially for a podcast at that level. <laughs> we have no, uh, no commercials today. I like it. Oh, that's <clears> great. <throat> We're commercial free, ladies and gentlemen. We're brought to you by the universe. Joe Rogan experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan podcast by night, all day. Ladies and gentlemen, a very special episode. Podcast sponsorship free. Uh, Dennis McKenna and Josh Wickerham. Josh is from the Ethno... Ethnobotanical Stewardship Council. One of the you were on the founders of That's this. That's right. And what exactly is that? Okay, Maps Associate um, podcast sponsor free. A very special episode. Hmm. Uh, they're not sponsor free. Joe is surrounded by Maps. Joe promotes Maps, and Joe is funded by Maps. Okay. And Maps is corporate. Maps is a cultural change, a cultural shift, and there's a entire CIA MK Ultra agenda behind it. Now, if you again, if you don't understand the history of the uh, uh, the, M the the cultural MK Ultra movements, please, please look into Jan Irving and his research. Um, he's done such a wonderful job at laying it all out and getting all the evidence out there. That's what this is. Okay, so let's go back to these maps. Is Rockefeller funded? Rockefeller funded again for Maps website. The David Rockefeller uh, family concludes uh, to the obituary, encouraging people to honor uh, Richard Rockefeller's memory by contributing nonprofit organizations, uh, including Maps. Okay, Rockefellers. 
backed by such private donors as this is uh, Hefner, which is it's, it's synonymous with maps, um, and, and published via maps, where they were doing the ayahuasca, the DMT studies, you know, the Rick Straussman, all the studies that Rogan uh, references are maps or Hefner studies. Okay, backed by such pri- backed by such private donors as Lawrence Rockefeller and Bob Walsh, and a Microsoft millionaire, which is Steve Wozniak, and this is easily provable by his association with things like Esalen, which we'll get into, and uh, in the countercultural and counterculture agenda. Uh, the institute is financing clinical trials with LSD, psilocybin, and other hallucinogenics. Okay, and then they say to treat phobias, depression, excess, whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's just to get funding. There's other reasons and other agendas for this. So let me, let me just state right now for, for those of you um, who, who don't understand my position on this. I have no issue with people doing, being able to own whatever substance they want, to being able to ingest whatever substance they want, especially when it's a plant or a natural substance. I have no issue with that. People should be able to do that. Now, I start to have an issue with it when it's being used as a corporate tool, a tool of control, because that's what's going on here. I offer you plant-based medicines, alternatives, but it's a corporate tool. Now, there's more to that. So, the value with working uh, with the system, this is the founder of MAPS, Mr. Doblin, coming from a Jewish family. Red flag. Now, again, you're, this is another common thread, which, to, as to be expected, the Jewish influence in it, the Jewish ownership of it, the Jewish dictation of it. The corporate goal. Goal of maximizing profit for our shareholders. I just want to make sure this isn't... Okay. There he is, Dennis McKenna, Wickerham, surrounded by MAPS people. Now, Jones is good buddies with Joe Rogan, right? Everything's all good, but he still absolutely hates Soros. Just like Trump says, leave Soros alone, Joe Rogan is working with people who work with Soros. But that's okay by Alex Jones. That's fine. We'll just, we'll just ignore that. We'll just ignore that, that agenda there. Um... So, MAPS is co-sponsoring a conference in collaboration with the Drug Policy Alliance. The Drug Policy Alliance. Again, MAPS working with the Drug Policy Alliance. Joe Rogan having on Ethan and Nettleman from the Drug Policy Alliance. So, do you see how that works? MAPS, Rogan. The masses. Information, or... Pentagon asset for the information age. Corporate asset for the information age. The National Drug Policy Alliance. Nadelman founded uh, the Smith Center in 19, Leiden Smith Center in 1994, a drug policy institute created with the philanthropic, philanthropical re- support, excuse me, of George Soros. So it was created via George Soros's money. Hmm. Hmm. You think uh, Jones would have an issue with that? He hammers on Soros all day? No issue. No issue with Joe. Nothing going on there, Joe. Joe just... Joe is 100% authentic, according to Jones. Billionaire activists like Sean Parker and George Soros are fueling the campaign to legalize pot. Now, is that a bad thing for it to be legal? No. Absolutely not. But... Here's the catch. There's absolutely a catch with it. And then also Peter Thiel, who's involved with the intellectual dark web in this agenda in general, is also investing in legalizing pot. Corporate weed. Eric Weinstein, the guy who termed the intellectual dark web, uh, managing director at Thiel Capital. Okay. Uh, Go Again, see all these guys hang out this is the intellectual dark web right here this is the agenda they're pushing 
again, check out Jesse Spots for like the mental health stuff. Uh, he's done a great job of covering it. This is the example I would like to use. So this is why this is a catch with legalizing pot and with these corporate agendas. So I want you to understand how this works. Fears of marijuana monopoly in Ohio undercut support for legalization. Now, people were wise in Ohio to this. Most people would just vote it in without even... Because, oh, it's legal pot. It's good. Everybody agrees. There's a catch. And this is the catch. That's because it specifies that just 10 locations in the state where growing pot would be allowed and a group of 10 investors have already, already have dibs on it. These are the same investors... Uh, these same investors are sinking $20 million into the campaign. Okay, if there's corporate support for something, red flag, first off. Secondly, this is the issue. They monopolize it, so they make it legal, but they own it and control it, and use it as a tool of enslavement and control. So do you understand how that works? So, I mean, what this is, is a brave new world caste system. So you have your alphas dictating to the people, you can't grow it, but I can. I control the supply. I control all of it. So I can get, I control what it is, too. They can genetically modify it. They can do whatever with it. They control it. So this is literally the caste system that we're seeing instated here. Now, the Brave New World caste system is literally the social systems theory that came out of the Macy Conference, which is Jewish. You guessed it, Jewish. And was the social systems theory was heavily... Is heavily promoted via the Esalen Institute, which Joe Rogan takes trips to. We'll get into the Esalen Institute here in a little bit after I finish up with maps. Um, but I just want to mention this so you have a, a kind of an understanding of the corporate agenda and the corporate control, as well as the cultural control going on here. Um, social systems is literally the brave new world cast. So you have all your sellouts and all these people dictating over the other groups and everybody has their determined system in society universal basic income the whole deal literally a brave new world oh and look the presidential candidate that supports universal basic income and joe rogan on his podcast blows it out to all the masses this is what you guys need this is what you guys want this is the good for society this is the direction we're going it's inevitable and he really has that much influence that people buy into it uh, absolutely uh, again running for president now where did this universal basic income idea originally come from well people like alan watts who was a cia asset via the esalen institute so here he is at esalen promoting this idea now um the esalen is essentially bohemian grove for the 21st century um for those of you who aren't aware um bohemian grove but they also study uh like thought architecture how to manipulate your subconscious and we'll get into some of that later as well uh for example i have this book um this is some studies that come out of esalen the real interesting ones are unpublished uh the physical and psychological effects of meditation so they're studying how the subconscious mind works they're studying on the people now the silicon valley people who go there you know the the, the uh the top people they don't get studied on, but they go there as like a retreat, as it's Bohemian Grove, essentially. So you have all these high-level Silicon Valley people going to uh, Esalen Institute, where all these ideas are coming out of as well, but they also create agendas there. So, for example, the Manhattan Project came out of, uh, came out of Bohemian Grove, originated at Bohemian Grove, and then ultimately was implemented. Same thing is going on in Esalen. It's Bohe just think of it in terms of Bohemian Grove for the 21st century. So again, you have someone like Timothy Leary or Ram, uh, Richard Alpert, who from Harvard, you know, who became Ram Dass. And what they would do, you know, they would go to places like Esalen. And then this circle created a following of thousands of LSD veterans who were then deployed to proselytize for drugs for the masters, the secret masters agenda, the corporate and cultural agenda. That's what they're doing here. Okay? So it's kind of a similar concept with like Rogan and all of his, the comedy store click. You know, Daddy Rogan and everybody just grabs their ankles for Daddy Rogan because they're just riding that wave. They'll do anything for Joe. 
they'll get themselves involved in all kinds of illegal things, do everything for him because they're indebted to him. So it's it's just a similar concept here. Okay, so let's give you guys kind of a map intro so you understand that the Rockefellers were funding it. There is a whole agenda going on there. And there still is, and we're living in it, and we're seeing the rise of it. So I want to read this for you guys. CIA maps after uh, embalming the dead. In the new millennium, the New York Times, the Baltimore Sun, and other large, uh, large, sir, excuse me, the Baltimore Sun and other large circulation daily newspaper highlighted research on psychedelics and ecstasy. Doctors at prestigious university medical schools produce studies promoting positive aspects of these drugs. These studies are often mentioned in an affiliated funding source research group, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies Incorporated, which is MAPS. Founded in 1986, MAPS received early aid from MK Ultra participants such as Timothy Leary, who also worshipped Crowley, which is Jewish mysticism. Or worshipped his promoted Crowleyanism. The former CIA uh, contracted inventor of LSD, Albert Hoffman, also donated to the funding of MAPS. The year before, the Food and Drug Administration had classified uh, ecstasy as a Schedule One drug. This made ecstasy illegal and addictive substance without clinical value. Rick Doblin, who is Jewish, founded MAPS. Doblin described his first acid trip, which reportedly led him to say he had been fortunate to be able to combine psychedelics with the pursuit of the American dream. The Reagan and Bush administration's IRS granted a 5013 tax exempt charity status to Doblin's North Carolina based MAPS. MAPS received large uh, contributions from billionaires like George Soros. Okay, so anything Soros is involved in, is it going to be good? Even if it sounds good on the surface, like legalizing pot or anything like that, it sounds good on the surface, but there's always a catch to it. It's going to be used as a method of control and further enslavement. The multi-billionaire uh, Pr Pratsker family uh, and anonymous British foundation. An anonymous British foundation. In the new millennium, MAPS listed major contributions of families and groups, including uh, Pratsker family, who had a net worth of tens of billions of dollars. Okay, so let's continue reading here. The relatively short article devoted about two paragraphs to MAPS founder Doblin. MAPS start during the Reagan Bush presidential administration seemed no coincidence. In 1986, Vice President George H.W. Bush's aide, Oliver North, jump started the Iran Contra scandal involving the CIA in trafficking cocaine, which is a CIA CNP operation. Once the former CIA director Bush re uh, reached the presidency, he appointed Dr. David Kessler as Food and Drug Administration Commissioner. Harkening back to the MK Ultra days of testing LSD in schools, Kessler approved university testing of psychedelics again in 1990, just after the U.S. Senate confirmation. Now we see Trump doing this right now, allowing these psychedelic plant-based medicines to be tested and approved. The approval marked the FDA's first psychedelics research in over 20 years. Dr. Kessler remained FDA commissioner for the next five years, including three years under President Clinton. Bush, President Bush also had Kessler fill FDA with like-minded research staff favorable to psychedelics. Why? Because there's an agenda. Not that they're necessarily bad or there's no uses to them. There's an agenda. That's what I'm highlighting here. In an interview, Rick Doblin said one of those leading doctors in the FDA was Dr. John Harder, whose vision, quote, vision was to train me, this is key, vision was to train me to understand how the FDA worked so that I could try to mobilize the demoralized psychedelic community to, to submit protocols. Doblin went to describe the history of his work, which inadvertently 
revealed his unusual power in the FDA. Even after Kessler's resignation under President Clinton, quote, there was a short period after he resigned in 1995 during which lower level FDA officials made it difficult to move forward with psychedelic and uh, medical marijuana research. However, I filed a complaint with the uh, ombudsman and the policies established by the pilot drug were re reaffirmed in 1999 by FDA upper management. Doblin further said Clinton's successor, President George H. W. President George Bush, pre, excuse me, President George W. Bush, also picked an FDA commissioner, Dr. Jane Henney, who is supportive of psychedelic research. From 2000 to 2011, MAPS articles showed up in newspapers worldwide. With MAPS funding of Harvard and Johns Hopkins research, the idea of LSD and ecstasy having health benefits spread. The New York Times, Baltimore Sun, and other newspapers helped spread MAPS propaganda, further legitimizing the group. The strongest evidence, so CIA, MK Ultra's 50 years of involvement. The strongest evidence of CIA continuing MK Ultra was revealed in the November 2000 arrest of 55-year-old William Leonard Picard, deputy director of UCLA's Drug Policy Research Program, for running one, running one of the largest one of the nation's largest LSD laboratories. Drug enforcement agents would also eventually uh, impl implicate Professor John Halpern and other psychedelic think tanks, the Hefner Research Institute which had worked uh, on many projects with MAPS, the, D the DEA arrested Picard at the laboratory site, a decommissioned uh, missile silo, which they actually weren't at that point. This is an interesting case. Um, they were set up by a DEA double agent, Gordon Todd Skinner, and they weren't arrested at the site. They were leaving the site. They were packing it up and leaving. They never actually produced LSD there because they thought they were being set up. DEA agents had enough raw materials there to make over 15 million hits of acid. Comprehensive articles in the Rolling Stone and San Francisco Chronicle cite evidence suggesting that Halpern, Picard, and others were involved in continuing this MK Ultra operation. This operation has links to the original MK Ultra LSD laboratories and universities, universities involved in MK Ultra, top government officials and LSD promoting think tanks. Okay, so an interesting MAPS connection. I wanted to finish with that drug trafficking story, that manufacturing of LSD story, because I believe there's a lot of that going on right now. As I said before, ask yourself, how are they able to give DMT out to people, just like the Grateful Dead used to give out LSD to people, illegally in this country with no issues? Because they're involved in higher level operations. They're involved in research programs, in MK Ultra style research programs. So we have, again, Halpern was mentioned who works with MAPS to this day, continues to work, or up until recently at least, with MAPS. And he was involved in illegally producing and selling drugs. Okay, so someone associated with MAPS was involved in the illegal drug trade. Put two and two together, that's exactly what's going on. We have these government sanctioned and corporate sanctioned uh, research programs that are also involved in the illegal drug trade. Now I want to play this, this is from my channel, I posted it a couple weeks ago. I think I've... Let's give this clip a listen here. I mean, I'm just going to speed it up a little bit. So this is from 2017. So two years ago, I was talking about a comedy club, The Laugh Stop, where I suspected that they were selling drugs and then laundering it back through um, their club there, or possibly this money is being donated back to MAPS for further research and, and further growth of this agenda. So selling illegal drugs and the money makes it back to 
uh, the legalization process, etc. Um, but this is interesting. Uh, identify a little place in Austin, other word, other cities in Texas, and will sell you drugs, and then they'll launder that money right back through their uh, little club there. But that's a different show or video. So money laundering is a good thing to look out for. Now remember, this was never referenced. Nobody ever referenced this prior to me sta stating this. Then after I stated this, these this comedy store click began to reference the laugh stop. And uh, it's great. Oh my Houston, god, Houston's great. Austin's great. Texas is the shit. You, I, Houston, I, I did an album in Houston. Is Austin, Austin on? Mm. Did you do it at the laugh act, uh, laugh stop in yes. River Oaks? Oh, yes, I that was. Yeah. I did an album. Is there. it there no more? No, it's there. Not that anymore. was. Well, that was the building is still there. Yeah. What is it now? Um, the they use PCD. it sometimes. Like they'll have shows there sometimes. I think someone had something there for a while. I don't know the full story, but that was one of the greatest clubs ever. Last stop in River Oaks. Remember that crazy dude was running it? The fuck's his name? Yeah. The fuck's his name? Bald guy. Uh, yes. Mark. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 He had an mine. Italian last name. Oddly enough. Joey knew him real well. Real well. I forgot about that yeah. dude. Yeah. Yes, and that was Bill Hicks. Yeah. Place. They had a fucking legit open. My boy Mark. We had a good time. I love it there. Just Cap cities. Oh, I love. I remember one day there was a guy you asked him about drug dealers. Let me tell you how wide open it is. Again, sorry to talk about this. The city, one of my favorite cities in the country, Hollywood, Houston, Texas, had a kid mm -hmm. that would come to your shows, Lee, and he would give you a bun, and you'd go, "Wow, <laughs> this is Houston. Where did you get this from?" He goes, "This is what I grow." And he'd go, "I got six other strains. You want to buy something?" He's like, "Yeah." You'd go out to his car, Lee, and he had one of those construction trucks with the uh... pack, with the panels and shit. And I wish I was lying to you, Lee. I wish I was lying to you. He would open up the panels, and he'd have little jars of weed. This is fucking twelve years ago. The last stop was still open. Yeah. This was at the last stop when Rogan was headlining. Those things that you see of Pete. Uh, that that fucking. Uh, Did you hear that? This is key right here. Yeah. This was at the last stop when Rogan was headlining. Those things that you see of Pete. Uh, Pete, let's listen. Last stop was still open. Yeah. This was at the last stop when Rogan was headlining. Those things that you see of Pete. Uh, that Pete, Pete. Now, who he's referencing there is Pete Pirelli, who was the manager of the last stop during that time. Uh, the Houston laugh stop during that time when it was open. So you have, uh, I believe his name's Felipe, who has the lowest IQ I've, ever, I've probably ever seen in my entire life, um, actually naming the guy who was supplying drugs to these comedians. While Joe Rogan was headlining, was Joe Rogan getting a percentage of this? Was there some sort of deal worked out here? Is Joe Rogan involved in drug dealing? These are questions you need to be asking yourself. Now, Pete Perelli, you can look up his... Um, his LinkedIn page, you know, he, he lists, the, lists the laugh stop there. The documents from the laugh stop list Pete as the manager, Pete Pirelli. And he's got a nice social networking job now, which is interesting given uh, where Rogan's gone with his career. Uh, and I think uh, maybe you should give Pete a call and ask him what was going on. You know, his number's listed there. Go ahead and ask him what was going on at the laugh stop during that time period. That fucking video that you see of Red Band texting me and me going off on him in 2003. That was then. That was then. This guy would show up to the shows, Lee, and he would have these weed containers. And then part of the conversation, he'd go, hold on. And it was like you were in that scene in Taxi Driver. I got fucking pills. And you're like, wait a second, what do you got? The one time he came to a show, he had Coke, Vicodin, Valium, Xanax, some tranquil IC you gave to retarded kids when they went over the top. PCP. He had something else. He had 20 different fucking things in there. He must have been your favorite. I used to give him 200 bucks, bro, and he would give me a to-go package that would <laughs> fucking make a mule sing. <laughs> he would give me like a half eight ball, fucking 20 Vicodins, 20 Xanax. You have a variety pack. Oh my God, he'd give me fucking animal tranquilizers. You have no idea. Okay, so that's key there. These guys are involved in the illegal drug trade. So let's let's think here. The illegal drug trade and then this whole maps, studying of the drugs, these are interlaced. If you continue to look, you will continue to find an interlacing between the illegal drug trade and the so-called legal drug trade. Now, I want to play this clip again. Um, oops. But, okay. Let's, let's watch this real quick. Well, let's do this one uh, first real quick. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Um, the ESC has sent out a call for experts, and uh, we've been infiltrated by the mainstream people that do evaluation work for the World Bank and USAID. They're interested in ayahuasca. People are wow. going down to South America to have these transformative experiences, to sit in ceremony. There's a lot of underground activity in the U.S. as well and, and Europe where it's it's not legal, but in South America, in Peru, ayahuasca is protected as national patrimony. That's uh, awesome. Okay, first thing that he mentioned, the high-level people associated with these 
modern Eleusinian mysteries, as Bruce Damer calls them. These are the modern initiations. So you have these high-level people, and then he says underground activity. Yet, you know, Brendan Schaub and Brian Callen could talk about how they illegally smoked DMT. Name who gave it to them, name where they did it at in, in Texas, but it's okay. They can legally get away with it somehow. It's illegal, but it's fine. They can talk about it openly to, to hundreds of thousands of people, but it's okay for them to do it. Why is that? Let's watch this clip real quick. It's when I get kind of... Do you want to make up your mind? I got something right here for you. <laughs> what is that? Mushrooms? That's mushrooms are. <laughs> I, gotta, I know. That's mind. exactly what they're for. Come on, bro. Let's make up your mind. How about Joe? If I... Uh, can you imagine if I took these on, and did the show before? Just take a little one like this. No, fuck that. <laughs> Nobody's got to get hurt. Just a little one. Jamie, would you do that? Maybe. Just a little one. I don't want. I don't want to be giggling in the car on the way It'll down, throwing up on myself. It'll be fine. What's it do? What's going to happen? We'll find I want to get out of here before it takes effect. We'll Guy's going to get out. me in a fucking some type of scissors lock. It should be legal. It's supposed to be I legal believe everywhere. that it would make people mellow the fuck out. Right? It would open that third eye, man. It would do something really good for people. The problem is you forget you take it sometimes. You know, like an hour and a half later, like why am I so weak? Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't want to be that far in my own head. Mm. That's scary. Have you ever done the float tank? No. You want to do that? Why well, can't? You I can't. I gotta float the fuck. Okay. So again, takes an illegal drug. Now this is just. Again, pushing an agenda because they're doing the same process that they're doing with marijuana, uh, legalizing that with uh, psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms. They're doing the same thing. They're, they're pushing to legalize that. So he's normalizing it by taking an illegal substance on his widespread podcast, massive podcast. He's allowed to take an illegal substance and there's no repercussions for it. Ask yourself, why is that? How is he able to get away with that? Well, he's pushing the agenda. He's normalizing it. It's just something people do. Everybody does. You know, you can. It's fine. And the thing that they're doing with the magic mushrooms is exactly the same that they're doing with the legal pot, where there's a corporate control over the substance. It's dictated by corporations. It's dictated by the alphas in the caste system, where they control everything about it. So again, like I said, and I'm not someone who hasn't tried these substance. I, I, I've, I've d done pretty much all of them, okay? But like I said, it, it should be legal. In my opinion, it should be absolutely legal. It should be truly free and undictated by a corporation. It should not be dictated by a corporation. You should be able to grow it yourself. You should be able to do it all yourself. It also shouldn't be pushed on people. The, the agenda of pushing it on people is a cultural agenda for a specific reason secondly it's a method of control it sounds great because these are plants these are funguses they should be available to everybody if someone chooses on their own will to take this substance that should be fine i have no issue with that but when there's a corporate control over it a corporate monopoly that's an issue when george soros is investing hundreds of millions of dollars when peter thiel is investing hundreds of millions of dollars that should be a red flag for you. You should be aware of this, and you should understand that this is a method of control. This is a method of cultural change, and this is a method of enslavement. That's exactly what we're seeing going on here. So you're not allowed to grow them. Only the corporate masters, only the alphas can grow them. Oh, and th this is another one. Um, this might not Tree be snake is on the brand. But I want you to listen very carefully here. Um, this is Bruce Damer. We'll get into him in a second. High-level DOD, direct Pentagon connection to Dennis McKenna. Now, it sounds like Joe Rogan does a bump of cocaine right here. I want you to listen for the bag, literally ruffling a bag. I want you to listen, listen for the snort, and I want you to listen for the drip afterwards. And, and also in the context of what Bruce is talking about, where people are hiding their drug use, and it should be out in the open and free. Waiting for her, waiting for her. And she, so she's getting high on all this sugar because we still get high on sugar. Here we are drinking our coffees, right, with our sugar. And she's watching. Okay, drinking our coffees with our sugar and he does a scooping motion. 
So, again, where, where is Rogan getting these drugs from? Is MAP supplying the drugs? Is Onnit supplying the drugs? Is the illegal drug trade and this uh, legal study of drugs, is it all synonymous with each other? I believe it is. That And that tree, that pattern of scales has evolved to mesmerize. Now, I'm not saying 100% that's what he did, but that's sure what it sounds like and looks like. Anyways, moving back to maps here. The corporate goal. George Soros. Oh, I forgot to mention, maps, another common theme you're going to see through all this counterculture MK Ultra stuff is heavy involvement with the Soviet Union. Okay, there's a reason for that. Uh, if you watch um, that KGB defector, uh, I can't, I'm, his name escapes me right now, uh, Yuri, Yuri Bezmenov, and he talks about how the KGB wanted to push yoga and, and these meditation and these Esalen uh, type movements within the country because there's a method of control with that. Okay? So, and, and, and it's on record. You can read the documents, how they would push it. They had a hard time. The Soviets had a hard time running operatives via the West Coast, and they found an in with the peace hippie movement. So, again... Maps working with the Soviets in the 90s, 1994, you know, or 92, right, right in that turning point, working with since 1985. So this is uh, this guy researching ketamine in the former Soviet Union, which is still the Soviet Union. If you don't understand that they faked their breakup, that was all predicted by the defectors, like... Anatoly Galitsyn, that's exactly what's going on. I would research that. But th he was researching ketamine, and if you go through here, it seems as though he was more interested in the subconscious mind than anything, what the effects and how to influence the subconscious mind. That seems to be his main focus here when working with ketamine on people. And they got contracts with military hospitals like veterans hospitals so where was maps born where did the idea come from well doblin mr doblin shares a fascinating story about how the idea for maps got started at the esalen institute in big sur california so again think of it in terms of the bohemian grove of the 21st century where you're having studies going on on people but you're also having these high-level Silicon Valley and people from, from every uh, institution going there and, and creating, scheming up new ideas and, and new movements and new agendas via the Esalen Institute. So, who goes to the Esalen Institute? Esalen, where you just were mm -hmm. on the Big Sur Coast. And they stored them at their in town. Did you see what happened to Big Sur? What? Unfortunately, those are out of Esalen. I'm not sure why, but Joe Rogan goes to the Esalen Institute. He's talking to Bruce Damer there. And I, if you haven't watched that interview with Bruce Damer, please watch that. At least the first 20 minutes of it or so. Um, it, it, there's, it's very telling. So we're going to transition on into the Esalen Institute here. So, the Esalen Institute. Again, like I, I, uh, I said, um, who visits the Esalen Institute? Who came out of the Esalen Institute? How much influence did the Esalen Institute have on the culture in shaping our society and the collapsing society of this country of the West? Well, here's some famous assets, cultural change agents coming out of the Esalen Institute. Alan Watts, Aldous Huxley, who inspired the creation of Esalen, Terence McKenna, Joe's boy, Terence McKenna, Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, Rick Doblin, 
uh, Straussman, Robert Anton Wilson. Okay? All these assets coming from the Esalen Institute. Having their Soviet handlers at the Esalen Institute dictate to them what they talk about. Every... Most of the agendas on Rogan's podcast are coming from the Esalen Institute. They're originally ideas stemming from the Esalen Institute, like I stated earlier with the Universal Basic Income, first created at the Esalen Institute, promoted via Alan Watts, now promoted via Joe Rogan's podcast, and we're seeing us pushed in that direction. So, the Esalen Institute... In 1962, Michael Murphy and uh, and Dick Pierce famously founded the Esalen Institute. Less well known is the fact that they founded uh, this institute based on advice coming from an older generation of mentors, such as Aldous Huxley, the guy who wrote the Brave New World Blueprint. Him and his brother Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley promoted or promoted the idea of uh, chaos via political, economic. Uh, etc landscape for a brave new world to rise out of it a centrist movement i'm I'm paraphrasing here um actually let me pull that up because this is important his brother uh, and aldous was involved in the exact same exact same agendas um and brave new world is a blueprint so julian huxley the end of evolution a category a new categorical imperative Purpose. This is coming from his agenda, Julian Huxley's agenda, Alice's brother, purposely create tension across the political, social, economic, etc. planes via liberalism, communism, and fascism. Now you can look at Trump as fascist. That's that's what he's portrayed as. So a collective new humanity will emerge. A collective new humanity will emerge. Now remember this clip? A collective new humanity will emerge. All this stems back to yeah, I'm hoping that having him in office is such a that the whole thing was such a clusterfuck, and and that so many people are so disturbed that it's going to make people more politically active, yeah, and more aware of the consequences of having someone like that in office. Yeah, and actually, weirdly, unifying. Yeah, because weirdly unifying. Okay, interesting. Mentors such as Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, Joseph Campbell. Now, Campbell, if you are unaware of these people, which is understandable because this research is suppressed, they've kept Jan Irvin, who really dug all this stuff out and droned through documents and things to uh, make this information available. This is a huge agenda that they don't want in the public domain. Go look at Jan Irvin's Logos Media. Go check out Logos Media. Read his articles over there, and l- please dive into his brain database. He has all the connections there. It is beautifully done. All the footnotes. You can spend months in the thing. This is an important agenda that is unfolding before us right now with history going into the past and then continuing into the future. All these people are covered by Jan Irving with Lawrence Rockefeller being another major supporter of Campbell. Lawrence Rockefeller was also an an important behind-the-scenes advisor to Michael Murphy since the founding stages of Esalen and donated millions of dollars to the Institute. Again, the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers are always there. Is that why Joe thinks it's ridiculous? Are the Rockefellers ridiculous? The Rothschild agents, the Rockefellers, are they ridiculous? I don't think so. The Packard Foundation, Ford Foundation, Ford Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, all had some involvement with the Esalen Institute in the early 60s and early 70s, which otherwise appears to have been reasonably profitable on its own. It would be clear what forces were behind the founding Esalen Institute. It should be clear what forces were behind the founding of the Esalen Institute, an institute we will get back to in a later chapter. Okay? These are all, this is, it's all footnoted. Those are all the references. Again, Esalen Institute. The sensitivity training and, quote, sexual encounter programs of the most radical California groups, such as Esalen Institute and its many uh, imitators, were all developed and implemented by Tavistock Tavistock Institute psychologists. 
Tavistock involved. Esalen Institute is Tavistock involved. Again, this is a hard book to find, and it's basically one of their only published ones uh, on them doing uh, studies and uh, and documenting those studies that you can uh, find. It's it's pretty lu uh, lukewarm as far as uh, what they're doing here, but it's again, it's thought architecture. Thought architecture. It's all about how to dictate the subconscious. Now, anybody can go to Esalen Institute if you pay, but you're going to be experimented on, and you're going to be, uh, you're going to be an experiment essentially for future programs and future operations. Okay, so I want to read this article just so people have a better understanding of how of what the Esalen Institute was used for and how how much the Soviet Union was involved in the Esalen Institute. I want to hopefully pull up okay let me show you this real quick this is from um, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on it um, This is a book by, oh, An End to Ordinary History is what it is. And it's all about the, uh, you know, the men who stare at goats type operations, which I'm going to get into later, which is involved with all this stuff. But it's really a smokescreen. It's, it's about those operations, the CIA and the KGB, and their interest in it. Okay? So it was written by Dick Pierce, one of the founding members of Esalen. And it's heavily influenced by Esalen. It's supposedly based on, on truth. So, this is in the, uh, the beginning of the book. My thanks to Jim Hickman, whose understanding and love, love, of the Soviet Union had informed all of us to work on this book. The Soviet Union was so heavily involved in Esalen, it, it makes your head spin. Okay, so this is a, bit, a really good article to refer to. How a famed New Age retreat center helped end the Cold War. Um, as far as understanding of uh, the Soviet influence over Esalen and how much they really dictated that. Um, I'm not going to read the whole article right now for this video. I'm going to do another video where I actually go through it because it's a long article. Um, but I'm going to read some of the key points. Um, again, just so you have an understanding, the Soviet Union promoted its foreign policy through the World Peace Council and other front organizations. So the Soviets had a hard time running operations via the West Coast, and they found an in with the hippie movement, the drug culture, the hippie culture. This is a good way to infiltrate and subvert the West from within. That's exactly what they were trying to do, and what they're still trying to do, because the Soviet Union still exists to this day. You all should understand that. It was a synthetic breakup. The defectors predicted it. Anatoly Glitzin predicted it to a T. So I'll just briefly mention some of the stuff this uh, article talks about. People from Esalen were allowed to go over to the Soviet Union and literally hand out literature, okay? No, no issue. Americans in the Soviet Union just handing out literature. Red flag. Um, they were doing things like helping Soviet engineers, giving Soviet engineers information on how to uh, redirect rivers and stuff like that. Like, literal, literal treason was going on via the Esalen Institute. And they would bring KGB people in. And there was a lot of compromising going on there because... This is what goes on there. A bunch of naked people in the hot springs. A lot of stuff goes on at the Esalen Institute. So it's a great place to compromise people. And, and that's a lot of what's going on there. Uh, similar to Bohemian Grove. So you're, there's a lot of KGB agents there that's all listed and documented. Um, again, a lot of the Esalen people... A big cover is the whole expanding your consciousness, telekinesis, uh, psychic warfare. These are covers these are smoke screens these are smoke screens and that's what they're using for their smoke screen to uh, run these operations and there's a lot in this article like i said i'm going to do a separate video on it and just go through the whole article. Uh, astronauts were interacting there, you know, with KGB people. They would bring the scientists in. Um, 
let me get down to Boris Yeltsin here. So Yeltsin came to America. This is before he was selected to be president. Came to America via the Esalen Institute. And they brought him around. They showed him around America. And after he came to America via the Esalen Institute, he was instated as a president. Okay? Esalen and Tavistot working together. This is track two diplomacy. People involved, that's where that term comes from, Esalen. Track two diplomacy. The idea was to forge new lines of communication between Cold War powers by bringing some of the USSR's leading scientists and spiritualists to Esalen Institute to mix with their counterparts in the United States. Maybe we all have common goals. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds pretty treasonous to me. Sounds like they were setting up for a brave new world. It sounds like the Soviets had a lot of influence over our people, and they were trading information back and forth. That's how some of the folks from Stanford Research Institute in Silicon Valley who would one day be responsible for funding and building the biggest technologies firms, met up with the Russian cosmonists. Now, this is all via Esalen Institute. They set up a series of events at Esalen's Big Sur campus. So you're having these... <clears throat> you're having these... These Silicon Valley people meet up with these Russian scientists. meeting up with these Russian cosmonists, scientists, okay? So, again, why do we see all these Soviet Jews running the high technology? They, I mean, if you... Uh, I uh, Some of you are hopefully aware of, like, the Talpiot guys and their research. Um, I think most of it's pretty much off the internet at this point, unfortunately. But the the whole Talpiot program, and what you see going on in Israel is all these Soviet Jews dictating Israel, because that's what Israel is. It's a backdoor into the West. So, again, a lot of it's happening via the Esalen Institute. Okay, so the, these cosmonists, these Russian cosmonists who were communists at the time, the cosmonists went further, went the furthest into its visions of transformation, calling for the end of death and the resurrection of the dead, and a free movement in cosmic space. Now, these are key narratives originating from Soviets, okay? Cosmonists influenced Soviet politics and technology. The cosmonists told Americans, LSD-taking spiritualists, that te technology could give them a way to beat death. So these are the agendas originating out of Esalen. So I think you're starting to understand what's going on here. We're not being beaten by machines, but by a league of tech billionaires who have been taught to believe that humans are the problem and technology is the solution. We must become aware of their agenda and fight it if we're going to survive. Now that's a key quote. Um, I want to play this clip here. There's some interesting stuff going on here. Rudolf II, you know, supported, he funded these alchemists. Yes. And the initial... Now, this is Bruce Damer speaking here. High-level DOD, like I said, friends with Joe Rogan, good friends with Dennis McKenna to the point where they smoke DMT together. Uh, and Bruce gets ideas for science via the DMT. Um, he works with NASA. He works with these think tanks. Uh, actually, well, I'll play that in a minute. The project was not to turn lead into gold, but to animate Rudolf II, you know, supported. He funded these alchemists. Yes. And the initial project was not to turn lead into gold, but to animate matter from dead to alive. Yeah. And that's been a passion of mine for a long time, but it was... A passion of yours has been to bring the dead back to life. Or to... And so goes on. To bring the dead back to life. Um, what did this clip say? What did what, what were the, the, the Soviet cosmonists interested in? Where did that go?
Where did that go? Uh, oh, Vision went furthest into visions of transformation for calling, calling for the end of death and the resurrection of the dead and free movement in cosmic space. Where do we see these agendas pushed constantly? We see these agendas pushed constantly on Alex Jones, and we see these agendas pushed constantly through the intellectual dark web uh, and, and Joe Rogan. Okay, so are we starting to see where their agenda is originating out of? Let's get back to this clip here. On the cycle forever, but we're far from the big win. But we're getting into the territory where if we could completely turn this around, we're going to the next level. Life extension, everything, it's really amazing. Sitting here on this planet with this incredible potential of space colonies and life extension and unlimited cloning, Something like a soul or energy or consciousness or something like yes, that. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, a form, like an Aquinas right. form, right? right. Uh, but yes, right. I, I think that th those are actually two different things in Judaism as well. Like the, the idea of tichiyat hametim, which is the idea of resurrection of the dead, uh, that's a different idea than what happens after you die, right? right. Tichiyat hametim is the idea that eventually the Messiah comes, that we'll all be resurrected back in our physical bodies at a certain point, which, you know, honestly, given the nature of how science is moving and, and the possibilities of cloning is, is actually less crazy than it, than it sounded probably a couple of thousand years ago. Yeah. I was born on Earth. I was the richest man on several planets by the age of 74. The first time... Now this is from a show which I believe is predictive programming and it's all about transferring your consciousness into clones. Um, which I think is the actual agenda. I think the whole concept which is pushed by Esalen um, is uh, the idea that um, uploading your consciousness into this hive computer is not the actual agenda. I think that is a false agenda, like what Elon Musk promotes. The real agenda is using clones and other things like that. Um, and the, uh, Bruce Damer also agrees with me. He'll speak the real agenda. That's what he does best. He, he talks openly about these things. And um, so, again, I think this is really what's going on. I died, I was 99. New technology transferred my consciousness to a new body. For 263 years, I slaved into new bodies, living on in perfect health. The vault for your every memory, your every secret, immune to aging or disease. The body will decay, but your memories live on in someone else's body. Your new slave. This is a real stash. It makes death itself. Only a memory. Hey, or no, Sunday at the National Space Society's annual event, I'm talking about China's new Silk Road. This is key here as well. Um, I'm going to skip over this for now because that's going to be the next thing I mention here. It's economy. I'm actually uh, in the Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, the two guys who can save us by opening a platinum highway in the sky. What does that mean? A platinum highway in the sky means a space economy. I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda, they will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even, and so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime. So they love their slavery. First off, psychologically uh, manipulated. Secondly, I'm offering you miracles. So you have your Peter Thiel types, your Elon Musk types offering you these miracles, these technologies, okay? Giving you this technology so you love them for it. And they use it as a method to control you, giving you these new plant-based psychedelic medicines you know that that might actually have some some benefits but they're using it as a method of control they're the ones dictating it they're the ones using it against you but they will be happy in situation where they oughtn't to be happy the fourth world now this is an actual agenda the fourth world and this is exactly what we see going on here 
No one really talks about the fourth world, do they? That's because we haven't seen the fourth world come about. The fourth world came up in the title of the Congress I attended. It was called the Fourth World Wilderness Congress. Maurice Strong said it was called the Fourth World because it was the fourth one of these environment congresses that Edmund de Rothschild had created. I learned later that the world order refers to the coming one world government as the fourth world. World control by the world order where there is no more first, second, and third world. Just a boundaryless planet which is called the fourth world wilderness. Yogis and shamans refer to fourth world wilderness dictated via Israel at the center, at the hub. But as the fourth world wilderness, the lostness of the mind. The lostness of the mind refers to the collective consciousness. Persons will be coerced through lies, drugs, fear and pain to surrender their selves, their egos to the collective consciousness. The fourth world will be a return to a society much like the Caesars or Babylon or the Fourth Reich within the fictionalized societies described in Huxley's Brave New World and Brave New World Revisited and Orwell's classic 1984. We will flourish with only a whimper. The world order wants to create a new society out of the ashes of chaos, a collectivist fourth world complete with a collectivist religion, collectivist finance, and unchecked world national socialism. The world order will offer Gaia, Mother Earth, to the masses. I don't think national socialism, I think international socialism, and I think the universal basic income has a lot to do with that. As the big brother image to worship in the fourth world. It was with, uh, but you can hang small dose. Cultural Mouth's uh, mission. We'll play these clips in a moment here. I want to finish up while I'm talking about Esalen here and kind of give an example of what comes out of Esalen, you know, type of some of the operations that come out of it. Um, so, Mind War. Aquino, Michael Aquino, the famous Setian, with the fifth degree of initiation is. Maga, M-A-G-A, -A, that's a fifth degree of initiation in the Temple of Set, which originates out of the Church of Satan, who he was also heavily involved with early on. Um, so Aquino, who loves the Soviets, was very close with the Soviets. So let's read this. Aquino was deeply involved with it in what has been called the revolutionary revolution in military affairs, or RMA. The introduction of the most kooky, third wave new age ideas into long military long range planning which introduced such notions such as information warfare and cyber warfare into the pentagon's lexicon in the early 1980s at the same time heidi and alvin toffler mentioned him earlier were were spinning their tavistock third wave utopian claptrap to some of the air forces which is air force space command which zach is a part of uh, Air Force's top brass, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, who was the first Army space officer, and other U.S. Army Colonel Paul Vallely, who completely supports Israel and supports the idea of Israel dictating the world, were co-authoring an article for the Military Review. Now that article, Mind War. So, uh, Carol Marshall, or Sherry Seymour, who is the one who un unraveled the whole Promise Gate scandal? Um, very well respected research, private investigator, very well, res very well, <clears throat> excuse me, respected. So she persists that with, uh, she persists that va the Avali, Valley and Aquino paper, which is Mind War, virtually spawned the entire revolution in military affairs. And its approach to warfare, military operations, other than uh, MOOTW, and viewing, and its asymm excuse me, and its asymmetric approach to warfare and military operations, other than MOOTW, in 
and viewing mainstream media as potential mind war operatives or alternative media. In a follow-up U.S. Air Force Academy study, we learned why warfare must become multi-dimensional. The fifth dimension, information warfare. Information overload, that's the fifth dimension of warfare. So this is from the... Okay, so the spectrum of conflict as portrayed in most readings is single dimension, linear, and continuous. It must be replaced by a multi-dimensional model, perhaps even a non-linear and discontinuous. Uh, topographical mathematicians would call it a manifold, hence the name conflict manifold. Its primary characteristic is multidimensional. Now, you know, the guy who tar termed the uh, intellectual dark web is a mathematician. And as we see with this Trump media, the nonlinear warfare is completely, completely out of control. Um, let's listen to this. It's almost like there's too many things happening for one person to pay attention to all of them. And if you're only focusing informational on informational overload, yes, exactly. Well, if you're this... only, but hold on, if you're only information overload, nonlinear warfare. Hmm. So mind war, which originates out of Esalen, according to Michael Aquino. Um, let me see if I can right here. This is where he admits it. He he's admitted it a bunch of times, but this is a clip uh, that you should go watch. He, he comes out of Esalen. Excuse me, I don't know what happened there. It comes out of Esalen, the Esalen Institute. It comes out of studies, unpublished papers called the Transformation Project, where according to him, they were studying thought architecture or how to manipulate the subconscious mind. How to dictate the subconscious mind where 95% of your thought process, that's a conservative number, 95% of your thought process takes place. So your database that you're pulling information from, your... Uh, the external stimuli that you absorb to create your uh, algorithmic thinking, your, your initial thought, your conscious thought, is being pulled from the subconscious. So these guys were working out via the Esalen Institute, who actually, Aquino got in contact with these guys because of their, their published works with the Soviet influence, their published works with Soviet thought architecture, which they Aquino somehow intimately knew the Soviet research there. So this is the core structure of mind war, which is exactly what Alex Jones's uh, operation is. Oh man, I should have that clip ready. Shoot. I'll insert it in here. Fight it. We have the zeitgeist. If you wanted to use an allegory, InfoWars has pulled the sword Excalibur. Others can't pull it. We pulled it. Trump pulled it. You pulled it. But if you don't use Excalibur, it's worthless. I am using Excalibur. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean I'm not going to make mistakes or stumble or fall. Or at the end of this, not make it myself. But the new republic, the rebirth, will be launched. That's what it's all about. All right. Boy, you know, Scott Adams, CNN is losing the mind war. I have some smart advisors, but I do what I think I should do. They've begged me not to tell you this, but I will because my weapon is the truth. This is from the Mind War paper that spawned the revolutionary, the revolution in military affairs, the future Soviet warfare theory within this country. These media are, of course, the electronic media, television and radio. Alex was one of the first TV radio broadcasters. That's what a podcast essentially is, television radio. State-of-the-art developments in satellite communication and video recording techniques. Remember, this is in 1980. Like the sword Excalibur, we have to reach out and seize this tool. And it can be, and it can transform the world for us if we have the courage and the integrity to enhance civilization with it. If we do not accept Excalibur, then we relinquish our ability to inspire foreign cultures with our morality. If then... If they then desire moralities unsatisfactory to us, we have no choice but to fight them on a more brutish level. So I'm not sure why I don't have the rest of it in there, but anyway, the core structure of mind war is this and weaponizing truth. Using truth as a weapon. The mind war 
operative must know that he speaks the truth. So taking bits of truthful information and using it as a weapon. Um, and our boy Bruce Damer knows all about All, knows all about Annie Marshall, and we'll get into Bruce Damer here in a, in a minute. Branch. So Andrew Marshall is one of these. He's a shaman. He's he goes between very quiet between communities, and what he decided to do. Get this. How so he's a shaman. Now Andrew Marshall's the guy who initially instated heavily involved in 9/11 as well. Andrew Marshall is a guy. He was originally appointed under Nixon, and he's the one who instated took Aquino and Valley's uh, papers and their ideas and everybody else who was promoting it and instated it within this country. It stated the future Soviet warfare theories. Now, in the Project for the New American Century, they say take advantage, post-2001, take advantage of these future Soviet warfare theories. And we've certainly seen that happen. So he calls himself a shaman, code word shaman. Um, I so again, he says he very quietly, he's a shaman. He very quietly goes in community, in between communities. So you could look at like Rogan's podcast. He's essentially a shaman on his podcast where he goes and snakes in between these communities. I do some kind of a practice. It's sort of a kind of global, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-technic shamanism. Uh, and I've been doing this for about 25 years. And what that is is what I call put yourself on the shelf. Get the idea. Yourself is parked on the shelf, and then you dive into another world. And for me, this has been these delightful worlds of uh, Pentagon think tanks, uh, NASA mission design, etc. Okay. So that's Bruce Damer. And again, like I said, we'll get into him in a moment. Oh, here's from Joe Rogan's podcast. Radar Gurlack? Dish. What is Gurlack? Gurlack. Oh, you haven't been out there, huh? No. Oh. I just, you know, I love hippies in small doses. Hippies to me are like pizza. You well, know, you, I just can't, I can't eat pizza every day for like a, a I month. Would, I was with, uh, but you can hang around Pliagon, Pentagon people. And yes, I could probably hang around your camp. But if I went out there with the really dirty with, people with Sherpas, 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 that's the they brought Sherpas. You know, they're they're white people, white they're, Sherpas. They're servers for the billionaires in their billionaire camps. Oh, that's too much. And they have walls of motorhomes. Around. I want to hang out with the hunt. So he's at over there at Burning Man, which is another excellent type of deal, major major importance with Burning Man, and he has these white slaves that are serving the billionaires in their billionaire class, which is what he is, high-level DOD, uh, etc. And he wants Joe Rogan to come out with him. Now, I also want you to, to uh, look at that shirt, Mad Scientist. Now, I posted this interview in my co uh, community section on my YouTube channel. Check that out. And I put an emphasis on Mad Scientist. I said, Mad or Mao Scientist for a better tomorrow. Um, and... And that was long before, a couple weeks before the Joe Rogan podcast with Alex Jones. Let's listen to what Alex had to say. They're making their move right now. Who's so, they? The, the globalist technocracy, the mad scientists, the guys that are want to learn the secrets of the universe. So probably already saying, have them. So we the mad scientists. Interesting statement there, Alex. The mad scientists. So this is Bruce Damer with. I might as well just get all this out of the way right now. This is Bruce Damer talking to Joe about Dennis. There's only been uh, two people ever that Dennis McKenna's rec recommended for this podcast. You and Josh Wickerham. So that puts you in very lofty company. Uh, yeah. Dennis McKenna recommended Bruce Damer on Joe Rogan's podcast. Interesting. Dennis McKenna, of course, heavily involved in maps and everything we've covered. You know what I? Here's a secret that I'll tell you on here. Oh well, it won't, it won't be a secret. Be a secret. Might so, want to mime it. So Dennis hasn't been to Burning Man. Dennis McKenna. Good. Me and him, same page. So I two I, old guys who don't want to party with young kids. So I told him <laughs> that 
Den- to tell you that Dennis would only go to Burning Man if you went. Oh, did and you do it the opposite way? You just playing us way. against each other? There you go. Yeah, that doesn't work with me, but thanks. That's sweet. <laughs> so Gerlach is I would the, go anywhere with him, though. Honestly. You'd go anywhere with Dennis. Yeah, I, w- I really would go with him, just to talk to him for days. Yeah, yeah, he's he's amazing. The world's most amazing. T- okay, and then also I wanted to point out there, uh, that was total L.A. vibes by Rogan there. I mean, complete L.A. I'm like, oh, thanks, that was sweet. <laughs> like, okay, Joe. Um, anyway, I want to wrap this up or move on to some of the Pentagon connections with Joe and his whole operation here quickly, because I was talking about Jones and Mind War and stuff like that. This is interesting, Doom, this is just an interesting connection. Doom was created by the military, initially funded by the U.S. Marine Corps, to train people how to kill other human beings. This is all admitted, you can read articles about it, and... Who was the major proponent of promoting Doom? Joe Rogan. They also made the video game Quake, which he still promotes. And Alex Jones promotes Doom as well. So Doom, this is actually one of the most iconic images from when I was younger. I used to see this picture everywhere. And there's the Doom in the background. And there's Alex Jones promoting Doom, wearing the wristband. So it's like this military... This game created by military intelligence is given to these information age assets to spread to the public. Just like other information and other agendas are given them to spread to the public. Again, Doom. Okay, so I want to move on into Joe Rogan's producer here real quick. And Joe Rogan's producer, Jamie, is pretty self-explanatory to me, or at least should be. Um... Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Joe Rogan has one of the the highest level podcasts out there, and he has a producer that struggles. He's not a very good producer. He's not horrible. He's better than I would be, but he struggles to produce his show. He's always having issues. There's always technical issues. Ask yourself, why would Joe keep someone like that who can't run the show properly at his level? Why is that? Well, first I want to show you this. enough talk to a lot of people in law enforcement military so joe hangs out with a lot of people in law enforcement and military now this is an interesting story jamie told on the podcast yeah a friend of my dad in the 80s he was uh he was on his way i believe to beirut and he was being tracked he found out once he got back he met ronald reagan and when he met president reagan he said it's nice to meet you we've been following you and he's like excuse me been following me so yeah we found out there was like a threat out, like after you like i think he fainted on the spot or something like that Whoa, he had no idea. there was a threat yeah <clears throat> he was just going to deliver hot dogs his name is hot dog harry he was trying to like, help the troops and stuff and what was the threat they were trying to kill him jesus yeah, christ at one for point, delivering hot dogs yeah at one point a, a, a car pulled up next to him and a guy with a gun had it like right up to his head and the, the, the cab got the cab driver thankfully knew it was happening like took off and he didn't die but, yeah. Why were they going to kill him just for delivering I, hot dogs? I don't remember the exact situation. Like, they weren't happy he was over there trying to help. Oh. So Hot Dog Harry sounds like an intelligence asset to me. And uh, I think that's exactly what he was. Um, for example, let me let me show, do this first. Um, okay, so I'll just... You should watch this on your own. I'm not going to play the whole... Um, the whole clip here but operation america loves you um was where they were delivering hot dogs in beirut and hot dog harry was involved there with jamie's dad michael vernon who we'll get into here in a in a minute so book says israel could have prevented 1983 barracks bombing with am spy book pan okay so or in lebanon excuse me hot dog harry was there a week before the this massive casualty of marines blown up and israel could have prevented it now this is the same story over and over again israel sets up our american troops to die for their benefit and hot you're trying to tell me hot dog harry was there a week before just delivering hot dogs and people were trying to kill him and everything just for delivering hot dogs doesn't make sense sounds like an intelligence asset sounds like a Mossad asset to me so 
let's go to Hot Dog Harry here. Um, let me show you Hot Dog Harry first. So let me show you a picture here of Hot Dog Harry, Jamie's dad's friend, best friend. Here he is. And, of course, he's Jewish. And there he is rocking the CCCP, Soviet Union shirt. He also spent time in the Soviet Union as well. You're trying to tell me he's not a Mossad asset? I mean, give me a break. So this is from his Jamie's dad's um, book about Hot Dog Harry. So this, he was, uh, he was, uh, Barbara Streisand, this is before she was famous, he was um, trying to, he used to sell sewing machines and he was going to repo her sewing machine and she asked him, if he's Jewish and he said of course yes Harry asked Harry work with me here I won't let you down and of course he worked with her today we know her as Miss James Brolin that's right the movie star the legendary singer and producer Miss Bribus Bribe Miss Barbara Streisand so of course he's Jewish and he's working with other Jews that just shows you how they operate um, he met famous people like uh, Trumpman uh, Capote and Tennessee Williams when he was younger. Um, a Jewish lawyer could help. Being a good Jew, that's what you do. He helped a Jewish lawyer get out of Havana, who helped him. And this was an interesting quote. Harry's life is blessed to have the right people come into it at just the right times. Now that is because he's Jewish. And that's how it works for Jews. They have, they help each other out. It's that simple. And one more quote from Michael Vernon's book, Jamie's Dad, about Hot Dog Harry. Harry explained when he was delivering a sewing machine to the Rothschilds that his parents used to know them in the old country. So Hot Dog Harry used to deliver things to the Rothschilds' house, and he said his parents used to know the Rothschilds in the old country. Interesting connection, Hot Dog Harry. Interesting connection. So let's just go through some of these pictures. This is from uh, Jamie's dad's Facebook. So just to prove that it's his dad. Uh, military family military family salute to my class uh 1576 bat uh, battalion 2 naz pensacola that's his class he is navy michael vernon his father is navy and his base that he came out of specializes in information warfare that's very interesting and then michael went on to create a radio station there he is the radio station there's Hot Dog Harry, Hot Dog Harry, some stuff about Hot Dog Harry. There he is. There he is again. Military family, Jamie, tagged him in it. So yeah, you, you, you get the idea here. That's who, there he is. There's Jamie and his father. So, my question is, why does Rogan keep Jamie? Why is Jamie still producing the Joe Rogan podcast if he's not that good? Well, it's very simple. He comes from a military family. It's because of his military pedigree. Joe Rogan's podcast is an operation. It's not what you think it is. It's not organic. I had mentioned Bruce Damer before. And uh, this is a very important, interesting connection. Now, this is a book from Howard Bloom, who is one of those intellectual dark web types. He hangs out with the same circles, and he's also involved in the counterculture. He claims that he is the one who actually started it. So let me play this clip real quick in reference to Howard Bloom. This is very important. This is a very important deception that these people are involved in. Um, uh, 
Saturday, or no, Sunday, at the National Space Society's annual event, I'm talking about China's new Silk Road versus America's Highway in the Sky. Um, the new Silk Road, the Chinese government's going to put in... So if you're unaware of the Belt and Road Initiative, the new Silk Road, unfortunately, I can't direct you to securing our interest. Um, they used to have a wonderful website full of references and articles that you could really dive into it and understand that Israel, China, and Russia are taking over the trade, and, and it's going to be dictated from Israel in the center, like you, the old Clovis map. They're taking it over, the Belt and Road Initiative, and America's nowhere in the picture. So nobody knows about the Belt and Road Initiative except for this guy. And what he's, you'll see what he's banking, what, what his solution for it is, but it's really a scam. It's a pipe dream to take away uh, from us actually doing something to prevent this Belt and Road Initiative by creating a space economy. Okay, so that, that's like mining asteroids and things, things that are impossible. I promise you they're impossible. It can't happen. And it never will happen. It's a pipe dream that people are going to dump money into. And that money is going to be taken and funneled into other operations for the bigger plan, the brave new world. A trillion dollars. It's a total of a $20 trillion project. It pulls together something like 66 countries and 3.3 billion people. And I co-founded and chaired something called the Asian Space Technology Summit in Kuala Lumpur last May just about exactly a year ago and it was obvious being in malaysia that china has bought malaysia's heart that americans don't count for much anymore because the chinese are already spending money they already own 15 to 20 ports they own 15 to 20 ports piraeus which is the port of athens the city that was the cradle of western civilization guess who owns it the chinese and they're upgrading these ports to do things that no port we've ever seen before has been able to do. So because they have a big vision, a really big vision, they're going to dominate the 21st century. Now, what he's leaving out is Israel is the main driver behind all this. And Russia benefits as well. The, 20 the Soviet Union benefits as well. This was the American century. This is going to be the Chinese century. Unless we counter with an equally big vision. And the big visions are not coming from Donald Trump in Washington, D.C., or from senators and congressmen. They are coming from precisely the people you fingered. They're coming from Washington. They're coming from California. They're coming from Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, the two guys who can save us by opening a platinum highway in the sky. What does that mean? A platinum highway in the sky means a space economy. Okay. To all those who have stimulated and sustained me. And then he includes Bruce Damer. And then, you know, like uh, Timothy Leary is in here somewhere. Um, uh, a lot of the... Uh, okay, so Howard Bloom talking on a message board with Bruce Damer. Now, Bruce Damer is the one who introduced Terrence McKenna to virtual reality. He's the one who set up the satellite on Ter Terrence's house in Hawaii, etc. We, we, we've been talking about Bruce Damer, the shaman. Okay, so Howard Bloom, Bloom talking to Bruce Damer about, no, this is Channel 4. Richard Metzger from disinfo.com. Disinfo.com. Channel 4, disinfo.com. These are big connections here. So, this is Disinformation, the company. That logo is actually interesting in itself. But let's look at key people here. Matt Staggs. Matt Staggs. Who is that? That's Joe Rogan's producer. Okay? Let's just look, pull that up real quick. Twitter. Now, here he is. This is this is 
Joe Rogan's talent booker, the guy behind the scenes. Okay? There's many guys behind the scenes with Joe Rogan, and this is one of them. And he is a key person with Disinfo, working with Bruce Damer, uh, etc. Working with Howard Bloom, Bruce Damer, etc. Channel 4. Now, let's, what do we have under documentary films? Endgame, Blueprint for Global Enslavement. That is Alex Jones's film. Now, that Endgame title he took from Paul Valley, the guy I mentioned before with the future Soviet warfare theories. That was initially coined by him, that Alex Jones took from him. But it's interesting, we see Disinfo working with, right, Joe Rogan's um, talent booker, the guy behind the scenes, working with Alex Jones. Disinfo working with Alex Jones, as well as Channel 4. Now, Channel 4 worked with John Ronson. John Ronson is the guy who wrote The Men Who Stare at Goats. Now, this is an interesting connection here. John Ronson... So, he, we're just t tying this up with some military connections. John Ronson is the guy who Alex Jones snuck snuck into Bohemian Grove with. So, John Ronson, working with the BBC at that point, is the guy who snuck into Bohemian Grove with Alex Jones, which kickstarted him. So, here we see Joe, or Alex and John hanging out. Alex having John on his show. And Joe and John hang out. And Joe has John on his show. Okay, so are we seeing how these networks play in with each other? Um, now, Alex on his last podcast with Joe was talking about how they were in films 20 years ago together. They were in John Ronson's films for the BBC or Channel 4. Right, working with Disinfo interesting name right and then you can go double check matt staggs you can pull up his podcast for disinfo he's very interested in concussions just like joe is very interested in that you know i think he'd be interested in my story uh you know if he was somehow able to uh understand my history i think he'd be very interested in in, in my life story um but anyway they these two work together and the men who stare at goats stubblebine thought that with enough practice he could learn to walk through walls with a brief uh, encouragement by lieutenant jim uh, lieutenant colonel jim shannon a vietnam vet whose post-war experiences at such new age meccas as the esalen institute and in big sur led him to found the first earth battalion warrior monks and jedi knights so the men who stare at goats actually comes from the esalen institute again we're seeing everything stem from the Esalen Institute. And then, of course, Alex Jones has Stubblebine on because these are the kind of operations. What they really are are Cywar operations. And this is an old email I had. Uh, let me read this to you. Because the men who stare at goats, it's a smokescreen is what it really is. Here we, here we see John Ronson, the men who stare at goats. It, that is a smokescreen. Okay, it, it's not it has nothing to do with army guys staring at goats to try to kill them. It's all about subconscious research. So, um, okay, so I quoted from a website: "The men who stare at goats actually demonstrates this by briefly, briefly, uh, excuse me, by briefly <laughs> referencing MK Ultra as if it were shut down when the real program is demonstrated at the end of the film." where Kevin Spacey character is involved in private psyops through ex explicit cultural creation. So it's a shift. What we're seeing is a shift. So I say this is one of my favorite examples to use because it shows what force-fed programs ultimately end up becoming. Regardless of what you think about their origins, I think I personally think the, quote, staring at goats narrative is a cover, not a major project. The major projects were never ended. If you study Aquino, one of his favorite tactics is deflection. Example, it happened but not like you think it did. It was really about staring at goats to see if you could kill them, not about thought architecture and mind control research. 
He would use this tactic by publishing papers via the Stanford Tavistock Institute. He would publish papers discrediting um, narratives like stereo goats or like the Stargate stuff, which ties in with all that. He would uh, publish papers via Stanford, which is Tavistock, doing psychological research to deflect from the real programs that were going on. Say they're studying trickery illusions, and ultimately how to uh, deceive the human subconscious, mind slash subconscious. Aquino says they're studying stage magic and spoon bending, with their real, which are often real, poorly funded programs, but they're only in place for cover, for a smokescreen. You really think the U.S. Army is going to dump funding into spoon bending, to a spoon bending program for practical use? Of course not. They're cover stories. So there's a, a lot more information about these networks. I could continue to go on and on and on for hours, uh, and I will in future videos, but I just wanted to get some of this information out there. Um, in future videos, I'm going to be talking about the the intellectual dark web, which ties into all this, the culture they're pushing, like I said, the rising centrist movement, the brave new world that I'm going to continue to focus on, continue to put this out there because it's such a deception that needs to be highlighted. Not many people are aware of it. Not many people are uh, in full understanding of it. Um, so with that, uh, I'll say uh, goodbye and uh, good luck.